Hey guys, what's going on? Today I've got a very interesting topic to talk to you about. Drum roll, please. Asynchronous JavaScript. JavaScript is described as a synchronous, blocking, single-threaded language. What that means is that only one operation can be in progress at any given time. Only one function can be run at a time, and until it returns, everything else in the program is blocked. You may have seen this in action if you've ever accidentally coded an infinite loop, or an infinitely recursive function, or encountered a stack overflow, and your browser basically locks up, freezes down, and becomes unresponsive. Even if an operation such as an HTTP request or a database query only takes a few seconds to complete, this can seem like an eternity in our age of lightning-fast, responsive web apps, and results in a poor user experience. So that's why it's really important for JavaScript programmers to be aware of JavaScript's single-threadedness and know how to avoid writing blocking code. So how do we solve the problem of blocking code? Well, that brings us back to the main topic of this discussion, asynchronous JavaScript. Asynchronicity in JavaScript, and in computer programming in general, is when multiple operations can be executing at the same time. In languages such as Java and C++, this is facilitated via multiple threads of execution. So how can there be asynchronicity in JavaScript when there's only a single thread? Well, there have been a couple of different approaches to working around the problem of blocking code in JavaScript. Three of the most common ones are callbacks, promises, and async await. We'll cover those in the second part of this video series. All right, so before we get into some coding examples, what I'd like to do is to take a brief minute to quickly review something fundamental to understanding asynchronous JavaScript, the JavaScript runtime and event loop. So here's a look at a typical JavaScript runtime. As the interpreter is parsing through the JavaScript source file, it creates something called a stack frame for each function that it encounters. It then places the stack frame on a first-in, last-out data structure, known as the call stack, where the function execution is recorded. When one function calls another, a new stack frame is placed on top of it. This process continues until the innermost function returns, at which time the stack frame is popped off of the stack. The same thing happens as the rest of the functions return until the call stack is again empty. You can think of the call stack as the single thread of execution in JavaScript. Now, the heap is a region of mostly unstructured memory allocated for things such as variables and objects in your running program. Finally, there is the event loop and message queue. The event loop's job is to continually watch both the stack and the message queue. When the stack becomes empty again, it checks the message queue to see if there are any messages waiting to be processed. And if there are, it puts them into the call stack one at a time and executes them. Each message is associated with a function such as a callback or an event. So another way to define JavaScript's single-threaded nature is to say that it has one call stack and one heap. So if we can see that the call stack processes one function at a time, and that all other code execution is blocked until the current function returns, then how is it exactly that JavaScript can run code asynchronously? Here's where the browser, or other JavaScript runtimes such as Node.js, come in to lend a hand. Now, when you bring the browser into the picture, our JavaScript runtime is augmented by a set of APIs that handle asynchronous behavior. These APIs include things like set timeout, DOM events, geolocation, and XML HTTP request objects used for making AJAX calls. It's important to understand that these things are not part of core JavaScript, but built on top of it and supplementary in nature. So when the JavaScript runtime encounters an asynchronous function in the call stack, it actually returns immediately via an implicit return, and the asynchronous process continues in the browser API. The callback is then registered in an event table and subsequently added to the message queue when the operation is completed. Once the call stack is empty, then the event loop will grab that callback out of the message queue and add it to the call stack to run it. The Node.js runtime provides similar functionality for handling asynchronous behavior. Although it uses Chrome's V8 engine, it does not use that engine's event loop. Rather, it uses an event loop in the libuv library, along with worker threads to handle asynchronous operations. By the way, libuv is a library written in C, and its name is an acronym for the Unicorn Velociraptor Library. <laughs> That's an awesome name. This library was written primarily for Node.js, but it can be used in other contexts as well. 
So as I was doing my research for this video uh, in preparation for talking about asynchronous JavaScript, I came across this really cool website that I want to show you guys. Uh, it's an online tool called Loop. Um, this was written by a developer by the name of Philip Roberts. And what this tool does is it basically provides a visualization for the JavaScript runtime. So we can write some code over here in the left side panel. We can run our code and then we can see uh, as functions are being added and popped off of the call stack. And we can see how all these other aspects of the JavaScript runtime, including web APIs, the callback queue, and the event loop work. So let's give this a try. So I'm going to write a very simple program here just to basically set a name and write it to the console. So first I need a function. Let's call this get name. Okay. And we'll just set a name variable and we'll just hard code this. Let's say Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's create another function called create message. So this is going to take in a name from the get name function. Oops. Okay. And let's see, what do we want to do here? Uh, I want to create another variable called greeting. And just set this to a simple message using the name. So we'll do hello name. Okay. And finally, I'm going to create another function to write the message to the console called write message. And of course, in a real world situation, you know, you might be able to take care of all these in, in one function, but uh, I want to break it up a little bit so that you can see how these are going to pile up into the call stack. So we'll just console log this message. All right. So what we'll do, we'll come back to the get name function, and after the name variable is set, then we'll go ahead and pass it to create message. Okay. And then we'll go back up to the create message function and we'll pass this to write message. We'll pass the greeting just like that. Okay. All right, so the, the last thing I need to do is actually get this program started by invoking get name. All right, I'm just going to clean up the white space a little bit. I'm going to get rid of the spaces in between functions just to conserve space a little bit since I've blown this up, I've blown my screen up a little bit bigger so you guys can see it better. All right, so I think that looks good. I don't see any mistakes, so I'm going to go ahead and save and run. All right, I hope you guys could see that. So we invoked get name. You could see the get name function being added to the call stack. Uh, then we added the create message function to the call stack on top of that, since it was invoked by get name. Um, and then create message invoked the write message. So another stack frame was added for the write message function. And then finally, a stack frame for console log was added to the stack frame. Then once that message was output to the log, um, by the way, I should show the uh, developer tools console. Let me open that real quick. And you can see hello Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> Just to show that this uh, function actually worked. All right, and then so yeah, when the message was output, then that got popped off the call stack and then write message was popped off, create message was popped off and get name was popped off. And then finally we ended up with an empty call stack. So let me run that again one more time so you guys can see because I know it went a little bit fast. Here we go, run number two. All right, very good. So, oops, I guess this uh, spacing got a little bit messed up once I opened DevTools. All right, I think that's better. Okay, so the next thing I wanna do is demonstrate what would happen if one of these functions over on the left was asynchronous in nature. So we would expect to see that stack frame then being added to the web APIs. And we should see the rest of the, the functions in the, stack, in the call stack continue to be executed. Um, and then at the same time, asynchronously, 
our async function would be executed in the web APIs, and then that callback should be added over to the callback queue once that's done. Then once our call stack goes back down to zero, which we should see our event loop kick in, pull that callback back into the call stack, and then execute it last. So let's give that a try. All right, so I think what I want to do is we've hard-coded our name to Bilbo Baggins. Um, now, what if we were, what if our program had to retrieve this name from a database? So there may be an async function there. So I want to simulate that kind of operation by using a set timeout. And I'll give, I'll go ahead and give this uh, callback a name just so we can see it. Get name callback. Okay. Sorry that it's getting a little crowded over here, but let me let me minimize this a little bit more, and I'll go ahead and clear that. So hopefully, hopefully you guys are able to see this okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is cut and paste our name inside of our set timeout. So that will simulate, you know, the name coming back from the database or an HTTP request or something like that. Let's set this to three seconds. All right, now let's rerun this program. All right, so hopefully you guys were able to see what was going on here. Uh, so first we invoked get name, um, a stack frame was created for that function, added to the call stack, executed. All right, and then within get name, set timeout was invoked. Now that is an asynchronous function, so we saw that come over to web APIs while the rest of the call stack continued to run. All right, so this is kind of the whole point of asynchronous programming, so that our code is not blocked, right? It continues to execute while our async stuff is going on in the background, Web APIs is handling it for us. And then once that async operation completes, uh, our callback, get name callback, gets added to the callback queue, where it waits until the call stack goes down to zero. Okay, Then our event loop kicks in, grabs that callback out of the queue, and throws it into the call stack and runs it. Now, I, there was a little bit of a bug, I think, at the end of the uh, something with the transition here, a JS error. And so that's why we still see the... Um, hello plus name here in the call stack, but that, that should have been executed and gone, and we should be looking at an empty call stack, but, but that's okay. I think you guys got the main point here. All right, now notice in the console we have hello, and what happened to the name? So because our name was being added via an asynchronous function, the rest of our program ran until completion, and so by the time the message was being output to the console, um, there was no name no name to be had yet. So let me ask you this, how would we go about fixing this so that we output again, hello, Bilbo Baggins? So one thing we can do here is to cut and paste our create message invocation and add it inside of the get name callback callback. That way we are guaranteed that our program's ex execution isn't going to continue until that set timeout function has completed until after the three seconds. So let's make that change, let's clear our console, and let's run this again. All right, and now our message looks good again. Hello, Bilbo Baggins. So um, what you've just seen is a callback. You've just witnessed one method of handling asynchronous functionality. This is just one way to structure our code so that it runs in a predictable way. And so we've ensured that the rest of our program does not run until that set timeout, that asynchronous function, has run to completion. All right, guys, so that concludes our review of the JavaScript runtime. If you'd like to learn more about asynchronous JavaScript, please check out part two of this series, where we'll cover callbacks, promises, and async await. Thanks for watching, and have a great day. Thank you.